And good evening. Thank you for coming along. Uh, before we start, I just would like to do acknowledgement of country. Um, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So my name is Ronald O'Toole. I'm an associate professor here in biomedical sciences at the Albury Rodonga campus. Uh, biomedical science is a new discipline um, at the Albury Rodonga campus. It was founded under the auspices of the federal government's Stronger Rural Health Strategy, in particular the Murray-Darling Medical Schools Network that was announced just last year. Primary goal of the network is the education, training and rural focused general practitioners to increase access to primary health care in regional and remote Australian communities where there is an ongoing shortage of GPs. Students enrolling in the Bachelor of Biomedical Science Medical degree at Albury Rodonga have a guaranteed place in the Doctor of Medicine at the University of Melbourne. We took in a first cohort of students in the program just this year, 2019, and applications are now open for 2020. We also have a parallel degree, a straight Bachelor in Biomedical Science, which can prepare students for a career in allied health, teaching, or in science communication. Uh, so speaking of science communication, La Trobe University, uh, here we aim to provide opportunities for students to consider various points of view surrounding the topics they're studying. This event stemmed from a number of subjects across science, humanities and health that examine not only human genetic technology but also ethical considerations surrounding its use. We're delighted to present such a highly and skilled, highly skilled and diverse panel of speakers including our own Dr. Katrin Hogarth from the Biomedical Science Discipline who will explore this topic and the implications it has for us in relation to science and our communities. We're also happy to host our facilitator, Dr. Seb Dworkin. Seb joins us from our Bundura campus. Seb completed his PhD in 2008 at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and spent time in research at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and Monash University before moving to La Trobe University in 2016. Seb's research is focused on how failures in our genes can cause birth defects that affect brain, nerve cell and facial development. The studies have involved work with zebrafish and mice, but his broad knowledge of genetic technology lends itself well to our topic here this evening. So please join me in welcoming Seb as a facilitator here this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction, Ronan. Uh, it was very, very professional, not used to being introduced in such, such nice terms, but thank you. Yes, I have been uh, working in the genetic sphere and especially in the embryology of genetics for quite some time, and so I was very uh, honoured to be invited here to help facilitate this discussion this evening. So uh, you're all here tonight to hear a range of views around what's currently happen happening in the sphere of human genetic technology. Now obviously this is a very, very wide topic. It's got a lot of very different and important subtexts and contexts. And tonight I'll introduce each of our panellists but I hope you will see that they each approach this issue from a very, very different professional viewpoint with a wide range of expertise. And so tonight, we'll discuss some of the issues and some of the questions surrounding human gene technology, and we'll also take some audience questions towards the end. And really, we want to have an informal yet respectful discussion. And we are obviously very aware that this topic does and can engender a lot of very strong emotional responses. And so one of the I think one of the great things about a university is that we can all come together and hold these respectful, robust discussions while uh, being cognizant of where everyone's coming from and how. So without further ado, let me introduce tonight's panel. So on the far right, we have uh, Dr. Catherine Hogart. Now, Catherine Hogart is a uh, researcher and a lecturer here at La Trobe University as well. She earned her Bachelor of My Biomedical Science from Melbourne Uni in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology in 2001. And then she did a PhD in Reproductive Biology at Monash Uni. She then did postdoctoral post uh, post research training in the uh, Washington State University. And she was there from 2007 and she was there for 10 years or so, I think, and she's only recently returned to take up a position uh, here at La Trobe Uni, lecturing in biomedical science and genetics as well, the Department of Pharmacy and Biomedical Science. So Catherine is the go-to expert for all things genetic and biological, because tonight we will discuss what we can do biologically and what we can do with gene editing, and perhaps what we should do. Up next in our panel, we have Dr. Chloe Stuttered. 
who she is a consultant clinical geneticist at the Austin Hospital and also the Royal Children's Hospital. She's a paediatrician by training, specialising in clinical genetics, and she's now also undertaking a PhD in at the Children's, also looking at uh, uh, different diseases in, in of childhood. So obviously a glutton for learning <laughs> a punishment. Which is a good thing, because you can never know too many things. The more you know, the more informed opinion you can have. That's, yeah, that's, that's probably a much better way of putting it, <laughs> rather than a glutton for punishment. So a love of learning, I like that, Chloe, that's, that's spot on. Um, so Chloe will tell us tonight a lot about the genetics, again, genetic counselling, what is it, what's available, how it's currently used, and also some of the ethics both currently and moving forward, what are some of the ethical applications, implications we'll need to address. Up next, we have Sarah Jefford, who's a family and surrogacy lawyer, and she's uh, come, down, come up, I should say, from Melbourne. So Sarah became a mother with the assistance of IVF and later donated her eggs to assist other families before becoming a surrogate uh, and delivering a baby for two dads in 2018. So Sarah also publishes the Australian Surrogacy Handbook and produces the Australian Surrogacy Podcast. And she is an expert in donor surrogacy, uh, donor, sorry, donor conception, surrogacy and family law. And Sarah uh, advocates for positive best practice surrogacy in Australia and also provides support education to help parents make informed decisions when pursuing surrogacy options overseas. And so Sarah will tell us Again, what the implications are for embryos, I suppose, if there has been genetic technology as they develop into adulthood and what ethical application, implications are around, then, around them. And last but certainly not least, we have Father Peter McLeod Miller, who's an Anglican priest navigating community issues associated with minority groups from the inner city to the Australian outback. He has associations from London, Westminster to rural Suffolk and is proud to represent a minority voice within the Christian tradition. And Peter is often caught in the crossfire between religious institutions, fundamentalists, vulnerable people and legislators. And so Peter balances the leadership of Christian community, membership of the Australian secular lobby with paddling on the Murray River, I'm told, where he claims to occasionally fall in over his head. So Peter will bring, I'm sure we're all fascinated to, to hear Peter's viewpoint as well as the church, I suppose, and, and more from a, a, another view, ethical viewpoint. So thank you very much to all our panellists for joining us tonight. And if I may begin our discussion with a question to Catherine. So Catherine, I'll ask you the question, I'll come and sit down, I'll pass you the microphone. So, what can currently be achieved through gene editing? What's current, what is it currently used for? And I suppose importantly, how has it evolved over time and where are we at at the moment? Okay, okay thanks, Seb. So this is a really big area in, in medical research at the moment. It's broad and to cover the, even just the current techniques in gene editing, would I could design a class that would run an entire semester. So for this discussion, I'm, I'm gonna focus it a little bit. Uh, and the one that I think it's most relevant and the most topical at the moment is a gene editing technique called CRISPR-Cas9. It was developed in 2012 when it was first published. And it, what it allows for is to make spe very specific changes in human genes or in genes of, of any species, really. It has revolutionized the way we can edit the genome of different species and is now globally used in a very broad manner in model organisms like mice and fish and rats, um, even in some livestock animals to understand the way different genes and editing those genes, how that then leads and drives disease. So the way CRISPR-Cas9 works is it utilizes a system naturally in, uh, in bacteria that allows them to fight off infection. So it's a protein called Cas9, 
And what it uses is a very small piece of uh, a copy of a piece of DNA called, called RNA. And that RNA guides the Cas9 protein, which is actually an enzyme, and allows that protein to cut our DNA in a very specific site. So we can design what we call these guide RNAs to edit any region of the genome that, that we want to. So like I said, this is broadly used now and it's allowing us to make very specific changes in genes, both to determine what happens if you mutate a gene, to look at the effect of that, so whether it causes a disease, but it can also be used to fix a mutation in a gene and perhaps correct uh, a problem. Uh, it's, again, it, and it is used broadly. Uh, I've used it in my research. Seb, have you used it? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's widely used um, and often in model systems. So as far as that, that's the technology. It's being used in a couple of different ways to edit the genome. We have, so there's a, a couple different techniques. One is called somatic cell gene editing, and this is where we can edit the genes of the non-reproductive cells in the body. So cells of the lung, of the skin, of the kidney, of the liver, any of the immune system, so any other cell that isn't going to be isn't either a sperm or an egg, or isn't going to become a sperm or an egg. This is widely now being used, and in, and in fact is in clinical trials as a treatment for um, different forms of leukemia, especially the really aggressive types, as well as a way of protecting against HIV infection. So they are currently clinical trials in that space. And so there's a little bit as far as the risk associated, often that type of gene editing is, is transient, so it doesn't, doesn't persist for very long because these are cells that are dividing and, and will die, and so often it's associated with needing repeat treatments. The other form of gene editing, which is to me a little bit more controversial, is what we call germline gene editing, and this is where an gene editing would take place in a cell that's either a sperm or an egg, a cell destined to become a sperm or an egg, as well as in a developing embryo where it, that mutation or that edit would then be in among, throughout the entire human or, or animal resulting from that embryo. Um, that's much trickier. Uh, germ cells, so cells destined to become sperm or eggs, are are hard to work with, <laughs> but it's actually, it's a little bit easier to do in, in embryos themselves. So there are ways of, of editing an embryo and where this is happening in model systems. As far as the evolution is concerned, we've been editing genes since, I think the first was about 1970, and this was uh, the, uh, the genome of a bacteria was edited. And since then, it's, it's come a long, long way um, moving through the sort of 1980s is when the first, the, we edited the genome of a bacteria so that it would synthesize human insulin and that insulin could then be isolated and given to patients who are diabetic. So that was a real advance. The 90s was a really large boom in the gene editing space. That was when Dolly the sheep was first cloned. And so that technology really changed how um, we think of cloning and, and creating someone who, or an animal that is genetically identical to another. Um, that technique that was used was really unsuccessful. So there was one dolly born from 277 edited eggs. So not really very efficient at all. And then more recently, we've become much, much better at making really specific changes in the genome so that we can more accurately map a genetic change to a specific disease state. And really it's been in the 2000s and beyond since we've sequenced the human genome that that's really come, we've made really large steps in, in being able to do that now and, and correlating traits um, with or, or disease states with specific mutations in the genome. So 
and it brings us to now with the invention of the CRISPR-Cas9 technology that we are now theoretically have the ability to edit genes um, in the mammalian genome, including humans. Thank you very much for that, Catherine. So it's a very, very detailed description of, of what's available, and it definitely sounds like at this stage the technology is definitely available to edit human genes. And so I suppose, and this will make a nice segue to, to Chloe, is that obviously we can edit human genes, but before we discuss whether we should, obviously we need to know what genes to edit and how. And uh, this is, I guess, where you come in with the clinical genetics and the genetic testing. So I suppose, could you explain how we currently use genetic testing? Uh, how extensive is the testing that's available? And also, how does it then impact on the treatment of patients? Thanks, Seb. And thank you, Catherine, for a perfect introduction um, to um, make sense of what I'm going to talk about. So um, as Catherine said, since the Human Genome Project and the mapping of the human genome, um, we can now um, sequence the entire human genome. So that testing is referred to broadly as next generation sequencing. It was a new type of sequencing technology that allowed or enabled um, simultaneous sequencing of the entire genetic code, all three billion base pairs of DNA, which makes up our genome. Um, and that sequencing method um, has become more and more efficient and cheaper um, over time. So that's now entered routine care in clinical genetics. There's two ways we can do it. Um, there's whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing. And I'll just explain the difference um, because it's whole exome sequencing that's used more routinely. So uh, the genome is made up of um, regions of um, DNA that code for protein. Um, so they're called exons. And then there's a whole lot of um, uh, material that is important, I'm sure. We don't really understand what it does, but we know that it's not coding uh, for protein. So each gene is a, a, in, in a set of instructions for the body to produce a certain protein, and that protein has a function in the body. So the exons or coding regions only make up about 1% to 2% of our entire genome. So there's an enormous amount of non-coding material, which we're starting to understand a bit about, but we're better at interpreting the sequences in the coding regions. Um, so by sequencing only the exons, where we think probably 85% of disease-causing mutations are located, it's a more cost-effective way to test someone when you think they might have a monogenic disease. So just to distinguish the realm of clinical genetics, which is a subspecialty within medicine, is interested in mostly in monogenic disease. Um, so that is diseases where the, um, the majority, if not all, of the features of the disease are caused by a single alteration in a single gene. So we're not talking about testing people for risk factors for polygenic or multifactorial diseases like risk factors for diabetes or heart disease. I mean, we're moving into that space and, and cancer genetics deals with that a little bit, but most of clinical genetics or medical genetics at the moment deals with monogenic disease that can be inherited from one generation to another. So um, at the moment, exon, exome sequencing is used routinely in clinical genetics practice, but clinical geneticists are the only ones that can request that test. And it's not yet got a Medicare item, so it is difficult to access still, though we have ways of getting it, but the access to all individuals is not um, always equitable. Um, and that's a big issue, but we're... Um, 
Now our work has created enough evidence to show the um, economic value of using exome sequencing early in the diagnostic process for a patient suspected of having a genetic disease. And that work which has shown, particularly in paediatric, severe paediatric disease that's suspected to be monogenic, we can identify a cause with this test in around 30 to 50% of cases, and that will change management for that patient in up to 20% or more of those individuals. Um, so through this research and evidence, we've been able to um, make progress in uh, towards getting a Medicare item number for this test, and it will not be long before non-genetic specialists are able to request this test. And not long before this test is in routine medical, um, part of routine medical care outside of the field of clinical genetics. Um, so uh, that's still exome sequencing. Genome sequencing is a better test in a number of ways, and I won't go into the details, um, but it's um, just far more time consuming and far more expensive at this stage. But as um, the technology becomes more efficient and the cost comes down, um, that's going to be the preferred test. So um, the settings in which it's used, um, uh, it's used in both paediatric and adult care um, as a diagnostic tool to investigate um, an individual um, who's suspected to have a genetic disease. And that um, identifying a diagnosis for that individual and their family is, um, can be incredibly beneficial. In the setting of um, a, a new family and a young child, um, it um, brings a lot of peace to provide an explanation for why this severe disease has occurred in their child. It gives them some information about what they can expect for the future of their child and if there's any treatment available, what is the best treatment um, and if treatment is still um, in the research phase, at least they can participate in that research and have and benefit from those results. Um, in the setting of um, uh, adult onset disease, often the um, uh, it's still a diagnosis is very useful for the care of that patient and an understanding for the, of the, for the individual, what, what the cause of their disease is and for their family, but also to provide information to family members who might be at risk also of developing that disease later in life or passing that disease on to their, the next generation. So that leads to another setting where we use genetic testing and that is in, the, um, in assisted reproduction uh, for couples who are at high risk of having a child with a severe genetic disease. Um, they can, um, unfortunately, again, not Medicare funded, so there's um, um, unacceptable inequality to um, access this care, but they can use assisted reproductive techniques like um, IVF and have embryos tested um, for a specific familial mutation. So there's two ways we can test embryos. One is, um, and this is called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, PGD, or you might hear about PGS, which is screening for the chromosome complement, not for an inherited problem, but just to see if the embryo has um, a normal number of chromosomes, and that's purely just to um, uh, maximise the success of the IVF embryo transfer. Um, but they can have screening, and then if there's a known familial mutation, um, that can be tested for in most cases. And then couples, um, uh, if they've chosen to test for that mutation, then any embryos found to be carrying that mutation are discarded and they have the option to transfer unaffected embryos and, and also to freeze any excess un unaffected embryos for um, subsequent pregnancies. Um, so they're the main areas in which I use um, genetic testing. It's very specific, it's not very sensitive. <coughs> so a, a negative genetic test, even if you've had your entire genome sequencing, does not rule out a genetic disease. There's still a huge amount we don't understand about the genetic causes of disease, and there are limitations to the technology. Um, so, um, as I said, we're still 
even in cases where we highly suspect a monogenic cause, we get a diagnostic yield from exome or genome sequencing still in the range of 50%, but it's climbing rapidly. In the course that I've been doing my PhD investigating genetic causes of um, uh, leukodystrophies, which are white matter diseases, um, diseases of the central nervous system that usually affect children and cause neurodegeneration and premature death. Um, when I started my PhD, um, we were finding, identifying a genetic cause in um, those children in around 50% of cases, and now it's pushing close to 90% of cases, and I know I'm taking a long time to do my PhD, but it's not that long. It's um, the, the same age as my youngest child, and he's about to turn five, and he keeps reminding me of how long I've taken to do my PhD. But, not long enough. yeah. Um, so the, the rate of um, progress is phenomenal. I think it's really important that we're all um, um, having these discussions, and it's, I'm really pleased to see everyone coming out to learn about this, and it's important that people become um, genomically literate, particularly students and young people, because um, genomics is going to very soon be a part of mainstream medicine. Um, and I think it's really important that we um, make sure access to that is equitable, including um, in particular to our Indigenous populations um, who we need to um, uh, take special extra measures and um, to uh, involve um, that population in genomic research. Well, thank you very much, Chloe. That was extremely informative, and it's really uh, stimulating, I suppose, to see how far genetic testing has come and what, what is available. And I suppose, and you, and you touched on this, and again, this segues very nicely to, to our next uh, panel member, Sarah. You, you touched on, on IVF as well, and obviously IVF has come a long way since, since the 80s to assist people who can't perhaps conceive children naturally to have children, and I suppose surrogacy is in that, that same sphere, assisting people to have children. So I suppose now it's a very good time in a discussion to speak with Sarah and to ask uh, around the current legalities of IVF and surrogacy in Australia. And so currently what's legally allowed when it comes to IVF and surrogacy? And also to extend on that, uh, based on your experience, both, both as a lawyer and, and as a surrogate, how should we as, as humans and as society, uh, consider embryos in the sphere of both genetic and reproductive technologies. Thank you. I'm really glad you didn't ask me any questions that were sciencey, because that's something <laughs> I do not. I have no <laughs> idea what they've just said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, so I guess I don't want to bore you with all the laws, but generally speaking, surrogacy laws are, are state-based. So we actually have seven pieces of legislation that manage surrogacy laws within Australia. The Northern Territory doesn't have any laws, which basically means you could do it, but you won't get very far. Um, so a lot of the surrogacy laws look very similar, but Victoria and New South Wales are actually quite different from each other. Uh, generally speaking, though, the process is that uh, the intended parents uh, need to qualify for surrogacy. So that means that they need to be unable to conceive or carry a child themselves. For a uh, same-sex male couple, that's obvious. It's essentially that if you don't have a uterus, then you would qualify. Uh, for um, opposite-sex couples, it may be that they, um, the woman doesn't have a uterus, but it may also be that uh, because of disease or disorder that she's not able to carry or to carry would be risky to her or a baby. So there is, uh, it's different to Hollywood surrogacy, you do need to actually qualify to get that far. Um, and then uh, it's altruistic in Australia, which means uh, we don't get paid to be surrogates and uh, the laws are quite different about what we can be reimbursed for, for lost um, out-of-pocket expenses, etc. Um, so the, we then all do a whole bunch of counselling, everyone gets legal advice, there's uh, agreements drawn up which are not enforceable, um, and then uh, they can all then head off to the IVF clinic and have an embryo transfer. So you can have a situation where, and I have seen this several times, where the intended parents are not providing eggs or sperm. They have a donor egg, donor sperm, and then a surrogate carrying the baby. 
And then at the birth, she is in fact the legal parent, and if she has a partner, they are also a legal parent. So they go on the original birth certificate. And then the intended parents apply for a parentage order which transfers parentage from the birth parents to the intended parents. And none of that is based on DNA. So there's no DNA test before we do a parentage order. It's essentially about intentions and what's on the paperwork to say this was surrogacy and this was the plan. So um, I guess there's a whole other ethical discussion about who should be on the birth certificate and um, how many people should be on a birth certificate, for example. Um, so I gave birth last year and my husband and I went on the birth certificate for Darcy. And so that's the original birth certificate. And I am, in fact, also her biological mother. It was from my egg, uh, but it wasn't my husband's sperm. And then when they applied for a parentage order, the parentage was transferred from myself and my husband to her dad's. One of them is not the genetic parent. And so she now has a birth certificate that doesn't list her birth mother, but lists two fathers. Um, so there's a whole other really interesting discussion about whether that's actually the right thing and maybe we should be allowing for more than two people to be listed on a birth certificate. Um, when it comes to IVF, pretty much um, anyone can access IVF and for a whole range of reasons. Um, there's a lot of um, laws around consent and particularly around donor rights and donor responsibilities. So uh, if two people are creating embryos together as a couple, it's a bit different to property, for example, where you might both own a house together and you can liquidate the house and split it between you. You can't do that with embryos. <laughs> but it's, that's not, you no. can't do that, no. <laughs> Sometimes they split naturally. Yes. It can cause surprises. Yes. Yeah. We also don't <laughs> split siblings. <laughs> so, um, but it can mean that if you've got a separated couple, for example, then a decision needs to be made about those embryos. We generally don't allow people to use embryos without the consent of somebody that has provided um, eggs or sperm. Um, and so when it comes to donor conception, for example, a donor will donate their um, eggs or sperm and they're consenting to their use and they can withdraw their consent at any time up to the point of that embryo being transferred into a woman. Um, have, they then don't have any parental rights or responsibilities once there's a pregnancy. They, they're just a donor. Um, parenting is nothing to do with DNA, really, is what the law is saying. Um, but if the donor does withdraw their consent, those embryos will then go into lockdown so that the IVF clinic basically can't use them until they've worked out the consent issues. And that would be the same for a separated couple, for example. Um, and I think the other question was about... I, I guess... My perspective, and uh, not just as a donor, but as a mother and also somebody that talks a lot um, with donor-conceived adults. I talk a lot generally. But <laughs> <laughs> I have a podcast because I talk a lot. Um, but I do talk a lot with donor-conceived people who are now adults. And so a lot of the time when we talk about donor-conceived babies, we forget that these babies grow into adults and have real opinions and they have a right to know information about their donor heritage um, and their conception and their birth family, if they're surrogacy conceived, for example. We've really come um, much further along in uh, Victoria in particular about access to information for donor-conceived people. So if you were donor-conceived, there's records there and you can access them from when you turn 18. I think there's still there's, uh, progress to be made in that way. There's no obligation, for example, on parents to tell their child that they are donor-conceived. It's a matter of them finding that out. And of course, for a child that has two dads, they're going to know. But uh, there's ways that people could hide, still hide that information. What we're finding these days is that they just do consumer DNA testing and they find out anyway. And I think that's probably the worst way to find out. We know from about 400 um, surveyed donor-conceived adults in Victoria that 37% of them were finding out that they were donor-conceived by doing a DNA test through Ancestry.com or one of the other websites. Um, so we know that they, ha they should have access to information, they should have knowledge of their donor conception and their donor heritage, um, but also we need to think really consciously about who's donating and how many times, because I've heard some horror stories of people finding out that they were donor conceived at 50 and then discovering that they have between 200 and 300 half-siblings around the world and they have no possibility of a relationship with their donor or with most of their donor siblings and there's a lot of trauma involved. So I think we really need to think about what donor conception looks like and we are getting better at that. Um, but thinking, I guess, when we're talking about the sciencey stuff, 
is what do these people think about when, when they exist? Because we're talking a lot of the time about hypothetical people. Um, so what, what is it that we're thinking about when these hypothetical people become real people and what are they going to think about what we're talking about now when they're adults and have an opinion? And, yeah, I think that's probably about all for me for now. Yeah. Passing the pass. Passing the problem. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Father Peter. Sorry, I will get to you in just, just one second, I promise. <laughs> yes, no, well, actually, this is, I mean, this is, this is fascinating when we come, uh, when we approach uh, these, um, uh, the rights of the child, I suppose, from many, many different viewpoints. And I think, Father, Father Peter, we're very interested in hearing your viewpoint, where I suppose, uh, should we let, perhaps, we've, we've heard that, we can do gene editing, we can test for a lot of genetic defects, we can do IVF, there is surrogacy, but should we just let nature take its course? And even if that course perhaps may diminish quality of life of the child, be it at birth, in childhood, or as the child matures into an adult? We would love to hear your, your, your perspective. So mine is an evolving perspective, and I must say also uh, to acknowledge the fact that as we discuss this, uh, that I'm so glad I'm a long way from the science. Excellent. <laughs> uh, and also, I do know people who have taken 20 years to do their PhD, so don't feel so bad. <laughs> uh, but also that as we're thinking about these matters, uh, we are, as a community, uh, evolving in our views. And I think to acknowledge where we've come from in terms of access and just the way, the possibility of even discussing these issues. I think it's something that does us all good. Um, because I represent an organisation uh, which has uh, a very a classical view, uh, which is based uh, on a period when uh, lines of authority were quite different from the ones that we enjoy today. Um, and that is we could not freely discuss these matters, I think, in previous generations. It would not be possible. Um, and that was also because we had a certain regard for um, religious institutions. Uh, religion and spirituality, of course, I think, is still part of our current world because they help describe uh, humanity and the way that we deal with each other and the way that communities um, are to function. Uh, but to acknowledge that, um, that in the beginning, as they say, uh, that, uh, that we used um, texts or, uh, or books that considered to have a divine mandate uh, to tell us what was possible. And uh, even, even latterly, uh, we find reference, even by scientists, perhaps our uh, most uh, famous uh, Christian scientist that I've met, Sir John Polkinghorne in Cambridge, uh, he was speaking about um, our reference, continuing reference, to, um, to sacred books that have been considered to have authority to moderate or to, to the, the behaviour and even the inquiry uh, of human beings and also the way that our relationships are ordered and the potential for, for change or interference. Uh, and he, even he uh, has used the idea of playing God. I think that's, that's the big phrase, I think. Uh, do we have the right to play God? Uh, and are we actually interfering in some sort of divine plan uh, if we try to uh, delve into the deep, dark and wonderful uh, areas of uh, genetics as we try to address uh, human problems? And perhaps just to say that Psalm 139, just in case no one's ever heard it, which is possible, um, you formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, that, of course, it comes from the Psalms, ancient poetry, uh, but it has cons been considered to be part of what even I have heard in my own upbringing to be the Maker's Manual. Now, if you consider that the Maker's Manual uh, is part of a set of uh, documents uh, that will govern the way that we interact with each other, the way that we deal with our own bodies, and also in terms of access, uh, the way that we're able to um, access even medical assistance or scientific intervention, uh, then uh, that's, um, I mean, it's, it's very interesting to see the places from where we've, we've come. Uh, 
there is a considerable diversity in the way that even religious commentators regard these matters today. And while we have groups of people who are probably still camped out outside Parliament House in, in Sydney over these matters, uh, while we still have people who um, tell their stories quietly about um, IVF, amazingly enough. Uh, I mean, I was speaking to some people who have the first people in our region who had an IVF baby um, uh, about, about 40 years ago. Uh, and they speaking about the, the, the fear of having a test tube baby and also the, the condemnation, uh, the fear around religious institutions. Um, and so one of the difficulties is uh, that we have a, a social context which has been informed by um, by ideas that are sometimes unacknowledged. I think it does us good to, to acknowledge where we have our society and our even legal framework has come from. Uh, and the idea that uh, also the, the nature of human beings as informed by uh, biblical, and not just biblical, but also if you think about Islam, um, Islam also uh, purports to be a system which gives you a total pattern for life. Uh, now, those patterns are great, those maps are terrific, um, but they are rather on the black and white side. Uh, and so it is only when the map runs out or you, when you end up in a series of wheelie bins uh, that you work out your navigation system may not be quite up to it. And I think that's where we're at today. Uh, so um, shall we intervene? Can we intervene? Um, uh, can we just let um, let's, the, the suffering of another human being or a child, uh, can we say that, oh, that's all that's, that's the work of the Lord? Um, well, in some situations and in some social and religious context, they're still doing that. And I think some of the reluctance, and Sir John Polkinghorne did say that he thought that uh, some of the reluctance of uh, people from a Christian background or m uh, more religiously inclined uh, communities such as America, <coughs> God help them, uh, uh, that they, there's a certain reluctance uh, to, to um, venture into this area just in case they might be playing God, just in case. Uh, uh, this doesn't, of course, address the areas of people who don't believe in God at all. Uh, so, uh, but nevertheless, in our society and our f foundational um, moments, this is certainly part of our social, uh, cultural uh, heritage. And so I think that some of these ideas continue to inform uh, our action or, or reluctance. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for that uh, perspective, uh, Father Peter. And so... <coughs> Now, <clears throat> excuse me. And so those questions that these panellists have been asked were prepared. What we're going to do now, before we get the audience outreach part of the program, I've been very busily compiling some questions without notice for each of our panellists. And if I can just ask each of you, when I ask, ask you a question, if you would like to maybe just spend two or three minutes to maybe tease out an extra point that you touched on that I think hopefully might be of interest to the audience. And then after that, we'll throw to you lovely folk out in audience land and we'll get uh, community questions as well. So, uh, Father Peter, I might go in reverse order now, yeah. and, and if, if that's okay. I might um, start with you. So, you touched on, and this is actually quite interesting, I suppose, uh, you touched on, on sacred texts being, being written many thousands of years ago and obviously, I suppose, haven't kept up with developing human technology. So how do you, and, and whichever hat I suppose you're, you're wearing, how do you see uh, other human interventions in disease such as vaccines and perhaps uh, transplants that are now largely accepted in the mainstream compared to, say, gene editing, which is quite a new human technology and how that might become adapted in the future? Well, I think um, you can see there's an evolution in, uh, in religious thought about this. I think it was in 2002 that uh, the Pope, uh, even the Pope, uh, said that um, they thought uh, 
uh, genetic um, interference, shall we say, uh, <laughs> would, be, uh, would be possible provided it was to do with assisting um, in the matter of disease. And now, of course, that's, that actually is, is a very, very long way uh, from uh, total prohibition, uh, which uh, they certainly started with. Um, it's, they've probably slipped backwards since then um, in, some, in some areas, uh, but uh, certainly uh, the idea that uh, that we can we can move forward. It's also about stewardship, I think, from a from a Christian point of view, uh, that the idea of caring for uh, the world includes the caring for humanity and dealing with uh, with in compassion um, and and loving action re requires us to step out of our, um, our comfort zones in that area. Uh, there is uh, although is, there is a can considerable difficulty uh, in, uh, in part of this legacy which we draw in even to the present, uh, and that is the idea of the inherent sinfulness of human beings. Uh, and there's a distrust of scientists, I think, in that area. And in fact, not just a distrust of scientists, but of, of humanity. And that is, we might well um, have the device, a device or a... Um, a um, a scientific breakthrough, um, but it is thought that we should expect that in the hands of a human being, being motivated by a flawed human heart, uh, we'll turn it to evil in some ways. So uh, I think that um, there is this, con it's as though the handbrake's stuck on, to be quite frank, uh, or we're stuck in a very low gear, uh, and uh, it, it, it has been the case historically uh, that there has been a reluctance to change, not just in terms of medicine and science, but I think in almost any uh, any social um, breakthrough. Um, well, just uh, I think the development of human rights has not always been assisted uh, by the institutions of the church, uh, and I think that that same history has been shared uh, with the sort of medical. Uh, evolution and uh, and also enlightenment uh, that we're we're currently enjoying. I think, in some ways, um, I think it was um, uh, David Ma who who said that there were some institutions that seem to be based around preventing the future, and uh, <laughs> it does ring a few bells. Uh, I think as I listen to that sort of comment. I like it. Thank you very much, Father Peter. Uh, now, Sarah, to you, this is actually a, a self-serving question because I'm actually okay, interested in, in, in knowing this. So by way of background, I'm, I'm sure my wife won't mind me saying this, we uh, underwent IVF as well, and we had, following uh, the birth of our, our son, we had some embryos left over, and we donated those embryos to we don't know who to for couples to conceive children. So I'm just wondering... Um, how have the laws changed specifically in that situation, both about the rights of the parents who donated um, those embryos, but also uh, I know many people do donate, I don't like to use the term unwanted embryos, but, but surplus embryos for medical research. And I suppose in the, in the last 10 years, how have the laws in those two situations changed? Sure. So... Um you may actually remember the case a few years ago, I'm sorry I don't remember her name, but it was a young woman who knew that she was donor conceived but she was not allowed access to records about her donor, but she had um, an aggressive bowel cancer, I think, and she it was terminal. And so she was campaigning to have access to her donor because she wanted to meet him but also wanted to perhaps understand a bit more about her medical history. And she was successful in having access and then there was this campaign that went on and the laws eventually <coughs> changed so that we now, uh, even if you have donated years ago when you were told it would be anonymous, uh, the laws are retrospective so you, you're not anonymous. And what that really means is that there's a few different options, we, uh, we call it the central register which is the Victorian Assisted Reproductive Treatment Authority that they monitor it or manage it, and births, deaths and marriages. So they work together to run this central register. So when uh, a child is donor conceived, for example, with your donor embryos, the clinic has an obligation to report to uh, VARTA to say that there's a pregnancy from these um, embryos and then details of yourself and your wife would be on that record. 
and uh, when there's a birth recorded, birth deaths and marriages would match up that information. What that means is that the uh, birth parents would give birth and register the birth and on the birth certificate it looks like everyone else's birth certificate. There's nothing that indicates that that child was donor conceived, it would just list the birth parents. When they turn 18, they can apply for their birth certificate and then they will have um, extra, it will essentially be another piece of paper that says there's more information available. And then they can apply to the central register to find out what that information is. So I think it's a good step in the right direction to say that people ha should have access to that information. But I've been reflecting on the fact that I pulled out my birth certificate recently to apply for a passport and it's the exact same piece of paper that my mum was given when I was born that I've never had to apply for a new birth certificate or a copy of a birth certificate. I've got the original. So if there's no particular need to apply for a new one, they will have the one that they were given or their parents were given at birth. And unless the parents then go on to tell them that they were donor conceived, they will have no reason to go looking. What we know is that donor conceived people do have a sense that something is different. And so the parents themselves or the recipients of donor gametes donor embryos are told you really, and given counselling about, you really should explain to your child that they're donor conceived from an early age. Um, I heard recently about a study that said that finding out after the age of three is too late, that they should be told from birth. It should be part of their story. Donor conceived adults are saying you should be celebrating the donor heritage, even if you don't know the donor, celebrating that they are donor conceived so that it's part of a positive story that they hear rather than finding out by mistake, because guaranteed they will do a DNA test one day, or they'll have some reason to do a DNA test, not think much of it, and then they'll get an email in the inbox saying, I think I'm related to you, and then it all comes undone. So um, what you and your wife could do, and what other recipients and even your children could do, is actually apply to the central register and say, we donated um, our embryos, and we'd like to know if any children were born from those embryos. And uh, they will consider your application. They don't just hand over the information automatically, but they will consider the application and who's asking and why. They might provide you with some counselling about the information that's there. And then most likely you would be told, for example, there was a baby, born, uh, baby boy born in March 2018, for example. Um, they won't give any other information unless the parents are uh, willing to provide that information. And they may already be on the register waiting for you to opt in and say, we'd like to be connected. So there are also fines. Um, if you were to try and find them on Facebook, for example, you're not allowed to go looking for them other than through the register, which is facilitated by VARTA. That's a very complicated way of finding it, of telling you. But yes. Um, I've forgotten the other question, though. Oh, it was about uh, embryos, oh, um, embryos that are going. I actually don't know. I've never. I, I know some people will think about it. I do find that a lot of people will contact me to talk about donating embryos and what do they do with them when they get the invoice for the storage fee. So that it's like the time to think about it is: oh, do we pay it or do we let them succumb or do we donate them to uh, medicine for research or do we on donate them to other people? What I find really interesting is that. Um, most people who have been an egg or a sperm donor are happy to be an egg or a sperm donor, but think very differently about embryos. So for example, my husband and I had a whole lot of embryos. We ended up using them all, but we did think about what would we do if we had some surplus. And the intention behind those embryos was that these were our children and our family. So I don't know that we ever could have got to the point where we would donate the embryos. And yet I've been an egg donor several times and I'm quite happy to give up my eggs because I'm intentionally giving them to the people to make a baby um, for themselves. Um, and I guess same with surrogacy, that I created a baby with my egg for somebody else to raise. It wasn't a baby that I created with my husband. So the intention is different. So the feeling about that a baby is different depending on the intention behind their creation. Um, but I don't know... Sorry, I don't know about the medical research aspect. I believe that it would be a matter of consent from both yourself and your wife, whoever has helped to create them, to then say yes or no to what the next step would be. Yeah. Well, thank you very much uh, for that, Sarah. It's opened up a whole new can of worms, which once I get back to Melbourne, I'll have to have a chat about. But that's, that's for, for another time. Um, Chloe, question to you. Genetic testing, so obviously we know some genetic defects that exist and, and, and you test for them. We obviously don't know a lot still and uh, research is being conducted into what genes cause defects. I suppose you, you mentioned that 
yes, knowing these defects can provide information to parents and their children, but I suppose what I wanted to ask you is what do you see as being the next step in, in terms of helping these children with genetic defects? How do we move forward other than, than providing information? Thank you. Um, so in terms of finding treatments, um, for most cases of genetic disease, knowing the cause is the first step. Um, so being able to improve the diagnostic um, yield for families has been enormously rewarding, and that's changed over five years. Um, when I was training in genetics, we'd um, uh, provide a medical assessment and say, I think this is genetic. Yes, this could happen again. Um, affect another child of yours in the future. Um, we'd base it on a sort of consensus with our colleagues, what disease we thought it was. We'd give it a name sometimes. Um, what the in mode of inheritance we thought it was to estimate the recurrence risk for the couple. Um, but it was... Um, pretty unrewarding and particularly when it came to answering a question of what can I do to help my child and is there any treatment? Well, if you've got no idea what's going on, um, it's very hard to treat it. So for I guess I'm limiting this, every disease groups are very different in how we manage them, but if we just limit it to say the, um, uh, probably the, the majority of patients I see are children with complex, severe life limiting diseases and um, treatments, um, there, there have been treatments that have emerged um, uh, in this time frame since we've been able to identify the molecular basis. Um, treatments have emerged to target that molecular basis or to repurpose known drugs that we know work on the same pathway. Um, and so it's, 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 it's significantly changed. And one good example would be spinal muscular atrophy, SMA, which is, um, affects one in 10,000 individuals, but it's the most common cause of, most common genetic cause of death in infancy. So it's um, uh, a neuromuscular disorder that leads to muscle atrophy and um, respiratory failure within the first one to two years of life. And about one in 50 individuals in our community are carriers for this condition, and if both members of a couple are carriers, there's a one in four risk in each pregnancy that the child will be affected. Um, so simultaneously, there's been a huge movement to mainstream preconception carrier screening to identify couples at risk. But simultaneously, there's been enormous progress in treatment with gene therapy. Um, so um, Newson Urson's a um, agent that's being trialled and um, completely changed the trajectory of SMA for infants. And um, not yet in trial is a, uh, well, potentially in trial, there's a single dose gene therapy for SMA. So potentially a single dose to be given um, at disease onset that completely modifies the trajectory and these children achieve motor milestones which they um, would not normally. Um, learn to walk, learn to talk. It's extraordinary. So it's absolutely changing the landscape when couples are found to be carriers or even found to have a, um, a child in utero to be affected. Um, how to navigate that decision about whether to undergo pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and avoid the trauma of um, losing a child in the first year of life or to... Um, well, likewise, the trauma of terminating a pregnancy, um, but then to consider whether you have the child and, and try this novel therapy, which we don't yet know a lot about. But everything's moving at such a pace that we need to think on our feet. And I agree with... Um, I think I was understanding what Father Peter was saying. <laughs> um, that I think we do have the capacity to navigate these decisions. And certainly in the medical space... Um, I guess maybe we're not those irresponsible humans with this. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I, I mean, this is, with, this is in the context of the Royal Children's Hospital where these decisions are made with a uh, large um, number of 
informed, caring individuals, um, professors of ethics and uh, law and everything else come together and think hard and very deeply about these decisions. We don't do it alone. Um, but it's a really exciting, it's an amazing time. I mean, if we didn't investigate the cause of these conditions, um, I mean, these diseases also teach us about normal biology. I think this is part of our evolution. Um, what I don't understand is if, you know, would, are we... Are we acting as God? If God gave us this power to have this knowledge and when a family comes to me and says, can you help my child, and I can, didn't God give me that, <laughs> that um, power and that's what I want to do. That's my job is to help them. Um, so... so you should, you should be acting God in that case. Exactly. It's the best but I'm just acting me, but I think <laughs> if you believe God <laughs> provided that education Absolutely. for me. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, it's, um, that's one example of uh, gene therapy really, really shaking things up. And um, the next... And, and also bringing, now that genetic testing can be done so rapidly, we've brought it into the neonatal intensive care unit where we turn around exome results in five days. Um, that's come with a lot of um, uh, implications, but also it's been very closely studied and reflected upon how it's impacted families. Certainly economically, there's no question it's the right thing to do because babies sit in intensive care units for hundreds of days at $10,000 a day and they have a terminal illness and but no one knows and so we just keep supporting their life and there's lots of big questions there but um, having a diagnosis has facilitated families to choose palliative care and, um, and, and change the course of care. Um, but also whether learning that your child has a particular genetic disease so early in the course may not be the best thing for um, bonding and um, yeah, it's there's no there's no right or wrong answer. But the testing is becoming so available; it's going to be available in the prenatal setting. It's already moving into prenatal testing where we suspect a monogenic disease. Um, that doesn't necessarily change management of the pregnancy, but certainly enables us to give families a lot more information about why that those ultrasound findings have been found and enables family to meet with other families who have children with the same condition and prepare for the birth of that child and um, adjust to that future. So um, did I answer your question? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just ramble. <laughs> Oh, no, that's completely my fault. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, yes, well, actually, so, sorry, Chloe. So you, you, you touched on the ethics surrounding this very complex, this, um, well, IVF and, and any gene editing technology. And Catherine, your, your question, and this is going to open up a can of worms. <laughs> so you can thank, you can thank me later. <laughs> But I'm, I'm sure many, many of us in the audience may have heard of the, um, I suppose, rather troubling case in China where a researcher recently has claimed to have edited a gene out of the human genome and brought those embryos to, to term and the, the two girls from memory were born. And the gene that he knocked out is a, is a gene which makes uh, people susceptible to HIV. And so he's reasoning was by knocking out this gene, these babies would no longer be susceptible to, to HIV. So there is a question there, I promise. So the question, I suppose, and uh, just um, to, in a nutshell, what are the biological risks of knocking out a single gene in, in germline editing? And, and what uh, cares and balances and ethical constraints have to be in place to allow that to happen? Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> so I'll start with the, the easier one first. When you, the reason why 
gene technologies become so incredible from a medical research perspective is we've been able to knock out genes in model systems for many years now. And in doing so, we can look, we, we can have a hypothesis. So if I, uh, I'll, I'll use one from my own background. A mutation in a gene called SRY. SRY stands for the sex determining region on the Y chromosome. There is a mutation in that gene. You can turn somebody who should be male and they'll actually develop as a female. So they'll have ovaries instead of testes. They'll have a female reproductive tract. They'll have a uterus, but genetically they're meant to be male because they carry an X and a Y chromosome. And, and in that sense, that, that was done, the first person to publish that was actually an Australian uh, by the name of Peter Koopman back in the 1990s. And that knockout mouse was fascinating. Um, and so we learnt that that consequence of just eliminating or making a mutation in that one gene changed the, the sexual fate of, of that animal. So really, gene knockout studies allow us to, to link a mutation in a gene to a trait. But sometimes we make a mutation in a gene in a mouse and it does more than what we thought it would, okay? So um, in the lab, uh, we made a mutation in a gene that's usually responsible for degrading vitamin A, so making sure that we don't have too much. So it's like the Goldilocks theory that too much of one thing can be bad. Um, we hypothesized that this would have an effect uh, in the bone marrow, but it turns out that it has an effect in partly in the bone marrow, in the immune system, it has effect in the reproductive system. And so when we think about genes that have more than one role or play multiple roles in multiple different biological systems, that's when it gets much trickier. And so from an ethical standpoint, if I can sort of wade into this territory as carefully as I can be, that if we are talking about editing a gene in a human and that bringing that human to term, we have to be 100% sure that we're not going to cause what I would call an off-target effect or that there be side effects to that mutation. Now there are some, and, and Chloe's already touched on this, there are some ge you know, genetic disorders where we, we are much more sure that a mutation in one gene causes one effect and that, that the, the product of that gene, so the protein, doesn't necessarily play a role in, in any other system. Um, I think one example of that perhaps is something like the BRCA1 gene, which is a gene that if you carry your mutation in that gene, as a woman, and, and even as a man in some cases, that your risk of breast cancer increases dramatically. And there are actually women who are BRCA1 carriers that are deciding to have mastectomies in advance of developing breast cancer because of, of how high the risk is associated with that. So, but it, if we were talking about, it, in any case, there would need to be extensive evidence from model systems that the gene that you are editing and, and, the, and the result of that editing uh, step and once you bring an animal to term, the, there are no off-target effects. And, and unfortunately, sometimes, especially if we're using the model systems we're talking about, so the lifespan of a mouse is about, if you're lucky, sort of two years, especially in laboratory, they tend to be have shorter lifespans, the, the laboratory bred, bred animals, fish. You know, they, we're talking about short lifespans in model systems. Humans live for 80 plus years. And so we, it's hard to model what a long, long-term effect might be. And so everything that we do in the lab, even in a model system, is highly, it's, it's judged by an ethics committee before we even start. Um, as, as university and federal regulation. So it's highly, highly regulated. And I can only imagine that if we were to make that next step, the regulation would be e even stronger. And when it comes to using even just human cells, um, the, the process for being allowed to do that in the lab is, is long, um, at times arduous, but it's all for, for very, very good reasons. And so I think that's from an ethical standpoint, the, we'd have to look and have lots of conversations about the ethics before we were to do, to even make that step. I will add on the point of the, the example in China, that work has never been published. So 
we wait and see whether we believe that it is actually, whether it's actually happened.